Easiest way to start is talking about Macap. There, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. No, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about the uh, the best athletic performance we've ever seen within the spelling bee, didn't you, Connor? Yeah, go on. Go and describe it because I think it's great. <laughs> so the, the spelling bees in America are absolutely massive. And they're hosted on ESPN. So it's ESPN2, it's proper grainy and stuff, not even high, high, uh, HD. And this kid walks up, Asian dick kid, obviously, eight years old, walks up to the mic, obnoid. He's like, he's looking around, looking a bit dizzy. He faints on the floor, completely blacks out. No one goes and helps him. The best part about this whole thing, the best athletic performance I've ever seen in life, is that he got himself up, spelt the word, got it right, and just walked straight off. And no one helped him. <laughs> no one helped him. <laughs> imagine, imagine if you pass out, right? They're going to be like, hold on, we need to cancel this. He needs to go to the hospital, whatever. He's like, he still remembers the word. He passed out. He gets up, says it, and he's like, I'm done. Let's go sit down. Let's I was like, go. that's elite stuff, right? That is elite stuff. But um, we've got a special guest here today, um, AV, AV on the pod. And he's got a different cap as well today. <laughs> Pink r and hat. Talk us through that, Amy. Yeah, so basically, firstly, thanks for having me on your Friday Friday lives. <laughs> yes, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, today I'm rocking this uh, very bright pink r and hat. And don't worry, guys, this isn't going on the shop. Uh, it was actually a gift from my uncle who decided to give uh, his, his nephew and uh, his son a cap for... For various for their various brands, he gave this is what um, his son got. And uh, I, got them out. I got the sorry. Do you want to shout them out? Yeah, yeah shout out cool. vaesthetics.com. Uh, so this cap is you know it's plain black. Uh, it's got VA, it, but on a mirror it looks like AV. And then I got a bright pink RNT uh, cap. Uh, oh, so I asked him. I was like to him, "Why have I got a bright pink?" And he goes, um, oh, "That's just what the sample sent." I was like, well, clearly, like, all the other ones are very strategic, and then my one is like bright pink. But anyway, it's at least it stands out. I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, like, if I'm walking down the street with this bright pink hat on, people are gonna take notice, and they'll hopefully uh, see what's on it. You can walk in the opposite direction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're just thinking, okay, we get shout outs on the po- on this podcast now. We need to, we need to be we a sponsor, that- sponsor of Reflex next. Yeah, yeah, Av, get the sponsorship <laughs> for us. <laughs> we need that Friday sponsorship. Sponsorship for what? For this podcast, you know, we need to promote. Well, well, as Canal said in two podcasts ago, is that he's never tried reflex before in his life. (laughs) 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 Avi didn't clearly listen to that one because he would have been like, mate, what's going on? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now now he's got to talk us through his jersey choice because obviously that's a big thing with their Friday lives now. Well, I was told I got to wear a uh, well wear jersey today. Where, by the way, where's your jersey, Nathan? I haven't seen one. Technical yeah. apparel. These are the training tops for LA Galaxy. Okay, fair enough. I just normally quite uh, quite loose on people, but just because I'm so massive, it's quite tight. <laughs> 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 well, I'm wearing a uh, so with a bright pink cap. I've got the the bright red United T-shirt. Um, so as you guys said, you know, apparently I'm looking like the the guys who sit behind Fer- who used to sit behind Fergie. Um, the the three C the three C clad, right? You do look sleek though today, like very yeah, sleek. My beard's looking a mess as well. So I think I've a different vibe going on uh, compared to normal. Yeah, changing from Akash Vigela to Akash Singh. Yeah. For the people that watch it on the podcast, we'll probably have to we'll probably put this up on a on a YouTube video or something so they can watch watch what we're watch what we're talking know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, we'll apply a picture. But yeah, today we're going to talk about is um, a few different things. Firstly, we've never had a podcast with us us three, uh, so I thought it would be great timing to get one in. And I thought we'd talk about a few things. Um, firstly, is, is the Last Dance documentary. So you know, we've been going back and forth about the Last Dance documentary quite a bit. And uh, to me, it really opened up the, 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 opened up the kind of box for high performance to the absolute max. If you think about what the last documentary covered, it's like it shows what you need, what needs to be done to kind of break through and get to that next level. So I want to talk about high performance um, with the last dance documentary, and then talk about you know what it takes to get the extra one percent in what you're doing, especially in an investment phase. And then after, I thought we'd cover uh, what it takes to be you know a high performance but a killer coach. And what I mean by that is like it's very easy to become a coach who's 
he's great at rapport. He's great at being nice and he's great at, you know, being personable and all that great stuff and has a nice relationship with the coach. But there's a difference with one who can do all of that plus get amazing results and, and, and knock them out of the park every, uh, all the time. And that's, that's a different skill in itself uh, and something we don't really see that often. Um, and I thought, given that we're, we're doing the interview process now, we're doing a lot of hiring, we're seeing what was coming through. We thought it'd be great to give people a heads up on what it takes to be a killer coach. Uh, Cause you know, our, our track record ultimately is, uh, is only possible with, with being killer coaches. So yeah, take it away. Let's, let's start with the last dance. Um, you've all watched it, right? You both of you obviously watched it. What were your thoughts on it? Like were you watching it? Cause I was watching it and, and relaying a lot of, things that were coming up to what we were doing and what we do on a day-to-day basis so what, what do you what sort of takeaways did you have go okay mate um so I, obviously i watch a lot of basketball and i have done for a long time and i've heard a lot about good stories about michael and what he was like you know as a teammate i heard all about the steve kerr story way back in the day but you never completely knew what he was like behind the scenes there was always this legends about him saying this is what he's like and this is like his practices were crazy but watching this documentary, you could see his intensity and the intensity that he had literally each practice, but also for anything he'd done, right? So in the plane, he's playing poker and he still has that intensity. And there's actually legendary stories about him playing poker right now. And, you know, he's absolutely battering everyone about it. You know, he's going to be hounding you about it. And in that sense, I realized like he had this singular focus for winning which was very rare in this society in this current moment. Like, if you think about it, who's like Michael right now in sports? There's probably only two people that I know. But if you think, it, even in, in general life, who's like him right now? It's, it's very, very rare. So for me, it was like, all the stories I heard, I got to see it in this 10-part documentary. And I was like, holy crap, actually, this is real. Like him, I could, I could see him why he punched Steve Kerr. I could see why he told um, Horace Grant, you can't eat because you lost or whatever. But also learning, learning about what high performance is and what it takes. And, uh, you know, if you, if you look at where he is now in terms of, you know, alcoholism and all the dangers of that, like how much he had to give, essentially, and where he is right now in his life as well. It's, it's, it's like those lessons you learn from it. So I've taken a lot from it. Um, but just the singular focus is something that I really, like, paid attention to from him. He just, all he had was, he just focused on basketball. Even if you think about the politics side of things, that they were spoke, speaking about in his documentary, he was like, I'm just a basketball player at the end of this. I don't know what to say or I don't know what to do. He still donated money, but he didn't want to get involved in it because he just, only thing he cared about was basketball. So I thought that was like, in this society, when, you know, we have social media, we have loads of distractions. I mean, that's a very, very powerful thing where it's like, let me just have the singular focus towards one goal, which is winning a championship. And then obviously he won multiple ones and never lost in the finals. Yeah. yeah. And that, that, that whole element of like never never losing in those finals, but also like re-motivating you again in that uh, in that environment is such a difficult task. And uh, when I look at it, I look at a, the 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 comparisons between him and the other players that I know from my generation or the generation that we watch the basketball in now. And there is no one like him. Only LeBron and Kobe are probably similar, uh, but not you, you don't until their documentaries come out. You never know. Um, but the roles as ever each of the people in the team. And how they played a role in, in his success, but also everyone else's success. And it was really to see, you know, how Pippin, how Rodman, the beginning of the big three, as we now, now call it in basketball, um, <clears throat> was the first ever big three and how, how they played together, interchanged new systems that they used um, with the role players and how each role player was very integral as much as, you know, Jordan might slate him and push him. You know, they were, they were as much integral into the story as he was. But he also was the cultivist and the, and the cultivator within the team that made everyone go to another level. What did they say? Like he would challenge you and make you a better person every single day. And if you weren't on the ride, you can get the fuck off. You know whatever he said. Um, and that was that was that was very interesting. And, and the last thing that I, I liked was that he used his own mentality for his uh, greater good. You know what? What did he say after the sixth championship? He's like, I had to motivate myself completely um, and tell myself different things to make sure that I could get the seven because it, it, all the things that he'd used for the first six when it was five to the sixth to me five to six sorry yeah. were, um, were 
we're all the same, you know. He but then he remotivated himself in a way where he could tell himself different things, make up stories about different people, and um, yeah, it's a it's a crazy way to, to change your mentality. And and he knew that he knew that he he could win himself win over everything by changing his mentality. Yeah, I think the singular focus is massive. I think the the willingness to do whatever it takes and not sell for anything less than than excellence is is a massive part. And I think we we take a lot of that into what we do on a day-to-day basis and, and how we sort of operate. Um, and it's relentless. Like, you know, being in his environment is relentless. And I, I can imagine that a lot of people wanted to be or tried to be, but they couldn't really hack it, if that makes sense. Uh, they might want it to be around Michael, but the reality is Michael was driving at such a hard pace that it was like sink or swim for a lot of them. Um, and then people like Pippin and Rodman and... Um, Steve Kerr. I mean, Steve Kerr sh- showed his worth in the end, didn't he? I know he, he's, Steve Kerr's the one who hit the three pointer, the, the the famous three pointer, didn't he? Um, yeah. And I, yeah. you know, they and also, John yeah, I mean, they showed their worth, but they also showed that you know Michael alone wasn't enough, and that you need, he needed that whole uh, he needed the the all the pieces in the puzzle in order to 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 be able to win. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're right, though, but the one, one thing I was going to say as well is one thing I learned from the documentary was Jordan always had the best team. No matter what, like, he's always had the best team. Um, when he didn't have the best team, he didn't win. So if you look at the 80s, he didn't have the greatest of teams. In the 90s, I was looking at it, I was like, he didn't really face anyone in terms of a big three. So that's what, if there's one slight, if I was going to look at it, it's like he only faced Carl Malone and, you know, John Stockton. But he didn't have any other big threes apart from that in the Utah Jazz. Charles Barkley in the Phoenix Suns, not really. His toughest opponent was LA Lakers in his first his first championship. And that's when he, he won. That was great. But he faced Magic when Magic was about to retire and stuff like that. So that's the only slight, I'd say, if you compare him to like, if you did a LeBron versus Jordan comparison right now, that's the only comparison I'd say. He's like, Jordan always had the best team. Even if you look at, his bench, he had Ku coach coming off the bench. So he, he could drop there any night. And he was a killer. If you, if you think about it, he was a killer, Ku coach. Um, so if he had always had really, really good teams. And that's probably credit to Jerry Krause because he built these teams effectively. And in, in America, you know, you have a salary cap. It's not like football where you can just go out there and buy players. It's, it's very, very different. You've got to be very strategic in, in a sense the way you build teams. It's never like, all right, I'm going to get Ku coach today. You have to actually draft them and you have to be very strategic. And go, I need to pay this guy this amount of money. That's why, you know, the first episode, Pippin was like, I'm not paid enough. But the owner goes, I wouldn't even take this money if I was you. Because he knows you're getting underpaid, but I need you to be in a salary cap. Mm. The way you build a team as well was very, very, like, important. Um, so that's why, like, there's a Jerry Krauss could be a villain in the doc. But he's actually, he's built a, a dynasty, but he also killed it because of his ego at the same time. Uh, because he was like, I could probably create this again. But he didn't realize, obviously, there was only one, Michael. So that was, that was quite interesting as well, something I picked up on when I was watching this. The, the team is always is important. Right? Team they, always. But they also did well. You know, the year when Michael did baseball, they did pretty well then, didn't they? They, they didn't win, but they, they came pretty close to. And their win record wasn't far off what, their, what they were with Michael. No, that just showed how... how yeah, um, that's true. That's good. Yeah, it just shows you how how good Ku coach, um, Kurt, all the other players like that were decent, and Pippin did hold that that team that was that year. Yeah, the only team he lost to, if you think about it, was Orlando Magic when he came back, right? Yeah. And now Shaq, Penny, Horace Grant, all of these guys. That was a big essential big three he lost to. So I always thought if he faced another big three in the finals, would he still have won? Most likely, yeah. But it's something that is one of those things that you you never know. Um, in that situation but yeah, it was, it was a great documentary probably one of the best sports documentaries out there I would say because I, I watched loads but I'll say it's probably top three for me yeah I was hooked I was hooked on it like I thought it's very rare to get inside the mind of someone who thinks like that who just like analyzes everything who has that willingness to just push beyond the, the norm and probably stay ride that line between performance and, and the red line so well uh, like we talk about trying to stretch the capacities. That guy was working at his capacity and like, and more without without uh, tipping on the other side. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he was definitely redlining like after midnight, like let's say 93, after 93, he was easily redlining every year. 
in my opinion. And in basketball as well, you're playing 82 games a year. So he he had this thing where it's like, I never want to take a game off. Like nowadays, there's this whole thing called load management where players can take days off, etc. He never used to take days off. So he used to be constantly on it every single night, every every game as well. Averaging 20, 27 points a game, 30 points a game every night. That's hard. And then playoffs start and that's when it really matters. And then he turns up another notch, which is crazy when you think about it, right? Not many people can do that at this moment. Yeah, how many people are turning up every day and dropping 40? Yeah, and we speak, no, no. We, uh, me and Kay might speak about that a bit when we're playing FIFA. It's like, um, it's like <laughs> I, I, what, is your, what is your sport? Or what, is your, what are your playoffs? And like, we treat like our days as very similar to that or try to do at least as much as we can. Where, you know, we're, we're thinking about us playing 82 games for every single day you know Monday to Friday you're you're treating it like it's a it's a game it's your it's your sport okay. and I think you know we were in America as well and we were speaking like we were at a game we were at the Cleveland uh, Cleveland Browns game and I said and center came up I was sitting there mm-hmm. thinking I wish I had a sport to keep me so motivated like for everything that I do like something that you could be completely uh, invested in where you like you you've got something to really really focus on I came away from the game and like why couldn't you have that, but just in a, not in, in a, a professional sport? And after after that trip, I was like, why why is what you not do on a day? What yeah? What what, what about if you what you did on a day to day basis was that sport, and you practice for that sport every day? And if you love what you do, you're just doing the exact same as that elite basketball player, or elite football player. But instead of playing in front 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 of seventy thousand fans, you're in front of your three screens, and you've got a bottle of water next to you. You know, yeah, your Gmail. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I just got my Gmail. Gmail, Gmail and Gatorade next to me. Well, no, think to go. About, if you think about that, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Like, if you want to be, let's say your 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 choice of professional sport is for us, okay, it's being coaches, right? Yeah. Or uh, how do we how do we practice for that? How do we prepare for that? And that way, that's where it comes to like, right, dialing in on your training, your nutrition, your your steps, your whatever your rules are. It's like that that that's like the. The, the training for the game and the training for the sport uh, and for match day. Cause every day for me, like when I wake up, it's like, it feels like groundhog, groundhog day every day. I'm like, I wake up, I've got to try and somehow get, go get through all this stuff I want to do, but there's no way I'll be able to do all the stuff I want to do. If, if I'm not ready for it, if I'm, if I'm not training, if I'm not eating well, I'll be crashed out by midday. Like there's only one way to, to be able to be going balls to the walls till from, you know, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day or whatever it may be. There's only one way to do it. And you have to be, it starts with uh, like, you know, turning up in practice and and fueling the body with the right the right um, the right things that it needs. Yeah, and the the sport that you're playing for, let's just call it that, can be anything. And we've got people like in their investment phases and in their in their phases later on, being the best mum and dad that they could be ever, yeah. or the best parents they can be, and then that defines their rules and that defines their state of play for the day and that defi- that defines what their practices are going to be like. You know, if you're going to use the sports analogy all the way through this. But, you know, it's, our game is coaching and our game is, you know, maybe some muscle building, maybe looking better. But that's a byproduct of now where this high performance level has come from and what we're trying to win on a day-to-day basis. But it all does come back to those filters down into practice, filters down into nutrition, filters down into how you're recovering and how you're, and what that means to you on a day-to-day basis. I mean, our sport is trying to win, you know, win this transformation game. It's like, yeah. how, how do we make R&T the best, you know, the, the, the winners? How do we make them the best possible uh, team, best possible system, everything? Okay, the only way to do that is if we're, you know, if we're turning up to practice on a daily basis, we, we're doing all the rules that allow us to perform at that, 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 um, that level that's needed to be at the top. And, and dropping buckets, right, at the end of it. Jimmy you know, Buckets! I remember telling AV this, I was like, oh man, it's been a good year. I was like, towards the end of last year, I was like, I think I've got like about 30 goals and I was like, transformations, right? But I was like, I always see it as a sport. Everything that we do is like, all right, whether it's goals or dropping buckets, if it's dropping a transformation, yeah, that's a bucket for yourself at the end of the day. You're like, yeah, this is, this is it. And you're trying to average the same amount each year to be consistent. That's high performance to me now. And after that, it's like, you don't want to just be that one season wonder. You want to do this now can you do this for now for the next 10 years? Yeah, you, don't city, right? you don't want to be exactly. Leicester City. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But then Leicester's another example. It's like, it was a 5,000 to one, like super, yeah. you, if you bet 5,000 times, it's not going to happen. That's yeah. how crazy it was. 
Well, think about what you said to me on that wall. We were talking, remember we were talking about um, everyone's got a position to play. And you're like, yeah. uh, you consider yourself as a striker, you know, getting the transformations. But then like, at the same time, you need the, you need the sweepers at the back in order to build the, to feed the systems. You need the, the central midfield, midfielders and the playmakers to, pay, to pass you the ball in the first place. Like it's all, it all needs to kind of line up together. And one thing I learned last year, and I, I talked about in that three years of business uh, article, they say like business is a team sport. It's not like a solo one man band thing where people, a lot of these people, they like to glorify the fact that it's one man band, but it's not. It's, just, it's a team sport and we're all like collectively trying to push towards a, a shared mission and a shared vision. And then we all have a common interest to, to win the championship or whatever it may be. Um, and uh, watching that documentary just got me like fired up. When I was watching, I was like, oh man, we're like the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> we, we like the Bulls. <laughs> um, yeah. Just like the mindset that, that the way all the different uh, parts of the machine just work together is is, is really cool. And I mean, I was it, telling Nathan this though. I was like, last year, I'm not sure if you remember this, Nate, but we were in the US and I was like, you know who we're like? I said, we're like the New England Patriots. I think we're, we're around the Patriots stadium. And I was like, we're like the Patriots, right? I was like, we've got this. Because Brady, another guy who's got, is elite, and he's been a quarterback for the last 20 years. And in the NFL, it's super hard to be a quarterback for 20 years purely because of it's a physical sport. You can be paralyzed within the next play, for example. So I was always like, I think we're the New England Patriots. Just the way we were quite consistent with everything that we were doing in that, in that moment and even right now. Um, but yeah, I'm always thinking, for me, it's like sports is the closest thing that I always pick out analogies from there. So for me, I'm always like, okay, this is relatable to sport in this moment. But yeah, I'm not sure if you remember that, Nate. No, I don't do it because simply it, it was so, so, so cold in New England. <laughs> and I didn't even want to be at that game. We watched half, we watched the second half at the bar <laughs> in the stadium. So imagine being troubled. In the stadium. Thousands yeah. of miles to go and watch that game. That was the one that we paid the most amount of money for the tickets. And we couldn't stand outside because literally everything was frozen. Minus 15. Yeah. Minus 15 is ridiculous. I mean, no. Well, that, isn't it, it wasn't it funny that that team mentality that in the biggest moments of the Chicago Bulls is that one of the other players, not the focal ones, were the ones that executed the, the last play. And that, you know, Paxton... Kerr, Kluko, they all in that moment, regardless of whoever took the limelight, whoever had, was the person that was the sole focus, is that they all had a role to play. And they probably never thought, and this is probably in most teams, they never thought that they will have the final punch or the, the, the last the last stance. Um, and, and actually they do. They have a massive important factor in, in, in the outcome of the team. Yeah. Everyone has a part to play. And I think that's the, the beautiful part of all of this. Uh, what do you think about, uh, like, let's say, let's say for that last dance documentary, I don't know if they'd covered many of the players who didn't make it, but like, what, what would, you know, if it's a sink or, if it's a sink or swim environment, what would cause people to sink versus swim? What do you think? What do you think differentiates that? Like, do you think it's a mindset? Do you think it's something you're born with? Do you think, it's something you can train. What, what do you think, or do you think it's something you have to unravel? Like if you're not if you're not aware of it inside of you because of whatever pressures or suppressions you've had in the past. Like what do you think determines that that sort of killer mindset? Depends on what you. Question you asked of is that how badly do you want to win? Mm. Right? Why Why do you play the game? Yeah. Why Why do you want to like win? Or why do you want to? Yeah. Why do you play the game first, and then why do you want to win? probably the, the two biggest questions you'll ask yourself. Because, yeah. yeah, there is probably players who played with them and, you know, either got traded or, or they, they left or just, just didn't play, right? They might say um, that they, they want to win or they have good reasons for winning, but they might they still can't swim in that. When the pressures, when the pressures and stakes are so high, they still can't swim. Like, what do you think differentiates that? Like the ability to take, like, feedback, the ability to be scrutinised, the ability to take constructive criticism, all these things, which for some people it can be, it can cause a defection, or it can be like, uh, it can cause that sink mentality. Or for others, it's like, I want more. I want to, I want to thrive off that. Or you know, you hear that and you're like, you get fired up. You know, like if you get fired up from from feedback or criticism or like, you know, jabs or whatever it may be, then you're probably someone who can survive in that environment. But if you get, if you're someone who defects and starts using different languages, different language that infers that you don't agree with it, all, all that sort of stuff, then you probably you probably won't last long. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. I think 
it does always come down to that core being. It's like if you're on that mission together and the mission aligns together, like if you know what the reason of that feedback that his jabs are, like Michael every single day coming at you, coming at you, coming at you, you know that he's doing it, he's an asshole, but you know that he's going to make you better. And if you're on board with that mission to the core of you, it's just how aggressive that person is towards that feedback will you find out sooner or later. Like if you're on that team and you walk in day one with Michael, you know if that core value is there. Whereas if you're in a team where feedback happens once every six months, you may get aligned every six months, but you, you can get coerced with the day, the whole idea of it, everything. But in reality, when you get challenged, what are you going to do? If, you, if you're in that moment and someone says to you, this is not good enough, but this is what we need to do to improve, are you going to walk away? Or are you going to stand up? That defines your mission and what your actual priorities are at this moment in time. Yeah. Yeah, so and have they got tested previously? That's the question as well, right? Was that sorry? Have they got tested previously? Yeah. You know, because yeah. if you if you never had that, and then suddenly you come to this, you may just freeze. Yeah. So it's it's knowing that okay, what environment you're going into, and then how badly do you want to win? You got to ask that self that question yourself all the time, and be like, actually, I do want to win, but this is what it takes to win. Also, it's never just mm-hmm. like, you know, this is it, and I'm um, I'm gonna get I'm gonna win, but there's a cost to winning at the same time as well. And it could be, you know, you're going to get feedback. It's going to be intense, but, you know, you get defined as a person from that after a while. Yeah. I, I, I find it, um, people find it very difficult to change. You either, I used to think like people can change the way they receive feedback. But I think you're, I don't know if the right words you're born with it, but once you, once you get set in your ways of how you respond to feedback or how you respond to criticism, it's difficult to change that. I do think that people can go from like a fixed to a growth mindset. I do think that, but, but I think if you're, if you're fundamentally someone who's got a fixed mindset, that's going to be difficult to change. But if you're someone who's only had a fixed mindset because you've never had the opportunity Mm. to be in a growth mindset environment, which I've definitely seen that to be the case. Uh, Like people who are, who I've known who've, who, when I first met them very much fixed, but they just need a, a few peeling back of their layers and the right environment to then thrive in. And then you suddenly realize, holy shit, like this person's, like, how were they doing all of this before for so long when really they had all these, uh, all this talent and all this uh, growth oriented behavior that just needed to be untapped. So the, the answer there is probably like, yes, you are the fix for growth, but if you're fixed, you might not be, you're not destined to be fixed. You just might not be in the right environment for it. Yeah. And then it's just, and then it's just practice after that. It's yeah, like, you're still you know, like it's an identity thing as well. Like you're stuck in the old identity of being fixed yeah it's like the investment phase. it's like when you um lose like 25 kilos you're stuck in that old identity of yeah. i used to be 95 kilos now i'm 70 kilos but i don't know how to act and it's like oh now i'm in a growth mindset environment i am i do have a growth mindset but i'm so used to being fixed that i don't know how to act or respond to it and i take it as i take it badly when reality is i shouldn't and i should embrace what this new mindset is yeah do you think that um the, that person who has that fixed mindset with all the all the the things the rest of the day that they may have by changing those things do you think that they you get a better version of that person coming through yeah 100 percent. like in my experience like those people can like they can do stuff that they didn't even think was possible they just need that coaxing coaching and, and uh unraveling in order to do so it's like a new set of rules a new set of acting isn't it it's a new set of uh, rules of what, what do you standard operating procedure. SOP. <laughs> like a, it's a new SOP. It's like, first of all, you get challenged and you don't really know this new SOP. Then you read it a few times and you get challenged again and it's, it's quicker to align. And then next time you get challenged, it's even quicker to align again. And then you may even grow a bit more and then you get challenged again and it, so that becomes na- natural. Um, I think the environment people are not only born with or they surround themselves with, it makes such a critical difference here. Uh, who you surround yourself with is probably the biggest one and they can really you can really shape your uh your mindset whether it's fixed or growth like if you're always around people who are fixed and like always thinking negatively or they put you down they suppress you you're just naturally going to take that that identity even if it's not who you really are yeah um so they always say you know it's a cliche saying like you know you are who you surround yourself with right it's a cliche saying but it's so true because if you're around people who are always like high performance and, and growth oriented and you are that internally like to the core and you on it if you're honest with yourself and you think am i really that and you know yourself you are and you'll thrive in that environment yeah. if you're if you if you're honest with yourself and you're, you're like yeah i am you know i'm i'm a 
I'm, I'm a high performer. I'm a growth oriented person, but in reality is you're not. The reality is you can't take feedback. The reality is you don't want to improve. Then you'll, you'll defect for a long time. And then all of a sudden you can't, you just, you'll sink. Mm. You can't fake it. No, nah, you can't fake it. Like you can't fake yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. They, um, I don't say now. but do you think that if you're in an environment long enough, do you think that, cause if we know that, 90% of all habits are environmental or, ch- or to eat, teach or taught. Um, do you think you can be in an environment long enough and then change over time? So if you stick, yeah. so, if you stick someone, like let's say you put someone who's fixed around nine other people that are motivated and in a different r- ball game, does that person become part of that team eventually? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes and no. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think you can fake it till you make it? What are your thoughts on that? I always think I am. <laughs> I think there's certain things you can definitely fake it till you make it. Uh, you can, you can fake a certain fake a certain way of being, and then it becomes normal. I think you can fake it until you get there, and then when you get there, you realize whether that is what you wanted in the first place. Yeah. You were just you were just craving to be fitting with that environment, and then you get there, and you're you don't actually progress past that point. Maybe that, and then maybe that's, I don't know. It'd be interesting experiments to run, wouldn't it? Like having, like putting someone in there and then saying like, all right, can you survive in this environment? Yeah. Um, or will you just sink, you just, will you just sink before you get the chance to survive? That would yeah. be the other thing. Like if you leave someone in that, like these people are going hundred miles an hour. Are you, can you keep up? It's going to be difficult. Like you can, you might be able to show a brave face uh, when you're with them, but behind the scenes, you're, you're, you're just you know, breaking apart. Is that gap too big? You see that in teams, isn't it? Like you see that in teams quite a lot. That uh, when an outcast comes into a culture, they end up kind of not being there and they end up just leaving. Like a lot of times, or they end up like if you look at sports, they end up getting traded or they're getting sold because they just couldn't fit that culture effectively. Like I've seen that with San Antonio Spurs, the Patriots, everyone's there and they're yeah. like, you know, I'm in this culture and they have a like I'm hearing explains, they say they have this way. And I just couldn't be there. Now, you know, it's, it's that culture essentially that defines it, but it's can you fit within that culture, I personally think, versus, you know, are you going to come in and whether you're demo or whether you're fixed mindset, growth mindset, it's can you fit within that culture? That's the real question that um, you should be always be you know, asked and, and found out. Spurs are an interesting one. Bang average players, uh, Parker, well, not bang average, a little bit better than average, Parker, Ginobili, um, Kawhi is an all star. Tim, D- Tim Duncan, right? Oh, the famous, that's one. Yeah, you've got you've got though like maybe two two all stars out of the three there. Yeah. But yet the others around it because that environment are all playing up, up a notch by ten to twenty percent just by being in the environment. It's like FIFA on Ultimate Teams when you get the chemistry right, you, your FIFA players play better. That's what it is. Yeah, there needs to be the culture fit though first, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, we know before we were talking about. Um, so I was listening to um, a thing around culture and it was by, uh, you know, we want to, um, one of our mentors, Dan Hill, and he's done a, he's done a podcast here and he was talking about um, the different aspects of culture. And he was saying like high performance, low culture is uh, a terrorist. So like they, they're really high performers, but they, they're low, completely low culture fit. And when they enter an organization or a sports team, they become like a terrorist in the organization. And they just, you know, they need to get rid of. I read them. Okay, <laughs> uh, give an example. After you say that, after you, sp- you sp- explain the thing, I'll talk to you about Kyrie Evans. <laughs> right, yeah. And then you've got uh, low culture, low performance, and they're rats. <laughs> and then you've got, <laughs> and then you've got, uh, so they just, like, they're just terrible. They need to get out of the organization straight away. And then you've got high culture, but low performance, and they're puppies. So these people are just like, they're shitting all over the place. They're, they're all, they, everyone loves them, but they, they just can't keep up. So this is that, that whole sink or swim. Um, and most cases are not, most cases they'll sink, but in some cases they will rise up and swim if, if they've got that kind of un, unlocked um, potential. And then you've got high culture, high performance, and that's like the superstar, the, the ideal uh, person. Yeah, that's when you win. That's when you win. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you've got a team of superstars, then you're going to win. If you've got a team, if you've got a team and you've got one terrorist, you'll bring everything down. Oh, hold on. Let's talk about that. Actually, if you have a team full of superstars, 
do you always win? Because in sports, it's never that. That's never the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. In sports, probably not. But in most other things, I think if you've got if you've got yeah. a, if you've got a solid team of a a a rated people, you're gonna do pretty well. In business, for sure, I agree. Yeah, if you were all doing the, like if we were all doing the same thing, then yeah, the answer is yeah. But let's say if we were, let's say if I had to do, I was an all star, but I was doing admin. I'd, yeah. I I would I would like for a day to day job like I I'm an all star in my check ins whatever transformation yeah but that's but, yeah but that's about being in the wrong position yeah but can you have all stars in all ah yes you can have all stars in different positions all yeah, stars exactly. not in the same yeah you need position. all stars you can't have ten strikers yeah exa- exactly yeah yeah, yeah. building a team have, yeah exactly so that's what a team is right you have to have the admin person for example it needs to be in the admin position if they're an admin person doing at the front playing striker. That's going to be a disaster, right? So, you, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're in the right position. And if you were in the wrong one, then no, then you become, you probably become a puppy. <laughs> you know, you know you're, you're high performance, but low culture. So, yeah, that's, really- and, that's, that's a, and that's about the, uh, the manager uh, fitting the, the all stars. Well, the, the, right the orchestra, right? The orchestra. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, yeah. the Phil Jackson. Yeah. yeah. You got to decide who's going to play in what position. Yeah. It's interesting. So Kyrie Irving is the prime example of uh, high talent, uh, low culture. He's been to like four different NBA teams. I think four or three. 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 And, three, and every single one of them hate him by the end of the time. Yeah. Don't want uh, Kyrie Irving. They don't want to play with him. He's he's fantastic. Gets injured all the time, but whatever. But like he's fantastic talent. But he just brings down every team. Uh, from either moaning, going on Twitter, just bad culture, just believe the big I am. Um, he's also he aloof in that sense as well. Like he believes the earth is flat. He's one of those guys, like <laughs> you know, in his spare time, will get trapped in some sort of theory and then he'll bring it to the organization. People are like, you're crazy, whatever. But he's very talented. And that's why he wanted to do his own thing. Um, and he left LeBron, basically. Yeah. And he actually he, apolo- he apologized to LeBron. And he said, I was wrong because I, w- I thought I was a leader, but I wasn't. So that's interesting as well. Like, because one, you know, LeBron was MVP, he won. And he's like, I took the last shot, I should be MVP. That's why he demanded a trade. And then he suddenly is like, a year later, he's like, actually, you know what? I was wrong in that situation. Man, it's great because he admitted to it, but not a lot of people admit to that situation. So, either. like, that is so big. And like, if you just take that, take that across to like business and other areas. How many times you hear that? You hear that, but you'll never hear anyone admitting that. Um, yeah. But that whole idea of um, that there's there's not as much glamour in being a team anymore. I don't understand why. Like when you watch something like the Last Dance, that, that should show you the power of what a team can do. Yeah, I love being a Rodman. <laughs> and this is the other thing. Like some people would be better as a Rod- some people would would be a better, feel more fulfilled, and be a superstar as a Rodman. But they'd be cr- they'd be a um, a puppy as a as a Jordan, and they're trying to be Jordan. And people are trying to be Jordan, but they really should be a Rodman. And they'll do better. They'll feel better. They'll perform better. They'll bring more value into the world as a Rodman. But they want to be a Jordan. Yeah, you see this all the time. Basketball is the best glamorized. example ever. Jordan's, Jordan's even... glamorized, but he's he's not the he can't do it without Rodman. Yeah, they... Jordan needs Rodman win before, right? Yeah, exactly. He didn't win before actually a team. No, That's the whole yeah. point of this documentary, I think. A lot of people now, because it's so Jordan eccentric, like everyone's like Jordan, 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 but they forget the whole like team aspect of it. No one's really focusing on the whole team. And they're like, hold on. He actually had a great manager, a great, well, I say GM, great coach at the same time, right? You think about Phil Jackson's won 11 rings, right? That's hard to win. No one's won 11 rings in basketball since, since, since him. Um, and then he obviously had a team around him. And that's why... He, if you look at other teams, no one had a team. Like they had great players, one or two players, but it was never a whole team. And that's why Jordan won six in the end. Um, so I think that's why a team and, and building a team is very, very important. I think it's also very underrated in that aspect. And you're right, like no one really talks about why building up a team is important or why winning as a team is also important. I think yeah, everyone glamorizes that. Yeah, it is glamorized. And you know, you hear the again another like cliche say, people are like, if you want to go fast, go just go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's like yeah. another saying that it just makes a lot of sense. Um, think about anyone who's done anything great. It's always with a team. 
uh, and, and it doesn't happen. The, the, the one man band is, is glamorized, but the one man band doesn't really get anywhere. Um, but the, the, that the Jordan is glamorized, but the Rodman and the Pippin is what drove Jordan to be Jordan. Yeah. Allowed him to, to do that and allowed him to drink, bring everyone else with him. So, yeah, it's a really good analogy. Even in solo sports as well, right? If you think about solo sports, it's done it's solo. solo, but it's not solo. It's still Floyd Mayweather is the greatest boxer of all time because he had a crew around him. Literally, he had a crew around him. His dad, his uncle, all of his trainers around him. He had His team was crazy. Well, and he I think even, even, sorry, an even better example would be Formula One, no? Like, if you think about that, like, yeah. that's, that's like a real example of like, you know, you're in the pit and like all that guy's doing is driving the car, but there's, there's so much that has to go on behind the scenes for that car to be ready and for that car to keep going. He's the within driver. a certain time period as well, right? It's not like, yeah, stops. just relax and then go. You have to be done within like a minute and then go again. Like that's yeah. pressure, but that's also delivering under pressure as well at the same time. Yeah. So let's, um, so you guys, you said you had a thing about a terrorist. Um, example. Yeah, hey, no, sorry. Uh, that was that Kyrie. was Kyrie. 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 Yeah. Uh, was... You want to explain who is or why? No, we, we just did. Oh, so, is that... no, yeah, no. yeah. He just did. Uh, there's loads of them that are quite a sim- uh, same example. Chris Paul, Kyrie Irving. They're all um, people trying to be all stars when they're actually role players. Well, Chris Paul is a great example. We, we can talk about him because everyone says he's very much like Jordan in his intensity, but he's got zero championships zero rings but then he's also hated at the same time because he's not a winner Mm. so imagine if jordan wasn't a winner what his life would be like after that so it's also knowing that you actually have to win you can't be like high performance or high intensity but then if you don't win yeah what's the point of that right yeah then you're just burning the candle for no reason that's an interesting point that's yeah, that's that's, that's, that's really interesting actually isn't it because that you go down the whole rabbit hole like why are you doing it and why you burning candles i think anyone who's got high performance mentality has probably got some sort of deep rooted thing that they're trying to uh solve as well i mean that's a whole different rabbit hole right the yeah, biggest it's, insecurity is your biggest driver yeah that's, like, that's it's always the case right yeah the more like on the spectrum you are the more you probably you didn't like look at I'd say the biggest example in the world right now is Elon Musk. Mm. Like, look at Elon Musk. That guy is like, he's on a different planet than most of us are thinking. But that guy's got his childhood and, and the stuff that he's been through and he's making, uh, his wiring is is one of the reasons why he just drives so hard, right? Mm. Like if you, if you break him down as a person. Um, so there's definitely something there. Like I, I was watching, I was re-watching Steve Jobs' documentary recently, uh, the film. And like, it's a similar sort of thing. And, and, Bill Gates, you know, I don't know if you've seen his one, but you know, his mom's explaining how he was always in his room and he was, he was like, he had something about him that was, that he kind of buried himself in the computers. So there is, there is, that is the whole, another rabbit hole, another whole, whole probably a whole different conversation, that one. Yeah. So with, with that, we'll, which we'll move on is that like energy can never be destroyed or it can only be transferred. So like if you are looking, you have a deep insecurity, like that energy there has to be transferred into other things some other people will transfer that into negative things and put it into coping mechanisms and, and then other people will transfer that energy into positives and you know that's where we see all of these examples come from and they always turn into a position of you going balls deep into something yeah. <laughs> if you think about um what the example of it going like you, having these insecurities or having these these things and taking high performance to another level but being channeled down the wrong way then you can think of things like uh, narcos or, or mafia or any any like gangs. If you think about them as as, as organizations and as businesses, it's ex- all they're doing really is just they're just their product is illegal, right? <laughs> their product's illegal and there's violence involved. But if you take away the product and the violence, it's the same exact thing. If it like they've got some sort of uh, insecurity that's driving them, it's usually some level of poverty or where they were grew up, where they grew up in, or the environment they grew up in, and that's driving them to drive so hard into high performance but high performance crime um and, and you know and their version of winning is different but it's all the same like you can apply these principles to everything you look at i always think of that you know we talked about earlier about your environment being the biggest detail i just think about if some of these people who grow up in in the um, like gang environments and get brought up into gangs 
and they run big gangs and they run big uh, organizations like that. Imagine if they were doing something that was legal, what they would be doing. Like they would have the potential to do stuff that we could only dream of because they've got that that next level thinking. Like you know, we've we've seen like um, like narcos. Imagine if like Pablo Escobar ran a legal business. Like what would he? I think there's a there's an interview about this. Like what would he be like in a normal you, yeah. environment, right? You, I think you sent me the interview. That's yeah. a really interesting question. Like that, I think that whole that whole thing just shows like whether you're growth or you're fixed, it's just how you apply it and the environment that you'll, you'll grow up in will dictate a lot of what you apply it into and how, all, much, you, all how wanted, much you can. Yeah, all he wanted to do was, you know, take care of his family, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> what it was. It was just literally from insecurity and he wanted to be like, listen, I need to take care of my family. But he went into like just the illegal side of things. The DA agent in the interview um, the, with pa- Patrick Bet David one, he actually said he would run a Fortune 500 company because that's how good he was. Yeah. Which is big, right? When you think about how many Fortune 500 company are there, number one, and at the same time, how many, how many would say, okay, I, he can run that? Not many, right? If you think about it in the world. And he, he was like, listen, I don't want to give him credit, but he could possibly do it. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it does come down to that environment, um, nature versus, you know, nurture debate as well over here, right? Yeah. yeah. I always wonder, like, you know, the, if you think about, okay, might be a bit taboo, but if you think about drug dealers, right? Um, like young drug dealers who are like 14 to 18 year olds a lot of them are like business masterminds or you know but they're just selling they're just what they're selling is just the wrong product <laughs> like just give them a, a phone to sell or give them a, a product or a, like a some sort of software to sell and what would they do then like all the things they do whether it's whether it's the the leader of the gang or the second in command or uh, one of the captains or whatever it may be it's it's like it's remarkable when you actually break it down. Like, what would it what would happen if you give these people the right things and the right opportunities? Right. You What's seen that, that with seen that with sneakers. Yeah, yeah, sneakers. Well, you seen these guys cool. run run sneakers now, where they all like. So this guy, I I think came out. I'm going to speak about this. This guy uh, used to go and get shoes uh, from a store, line up, uh, and go and basically tent overnight, go and get a new pair of Jordans, sell them for double. Then he go back and get his three of his mates. He pay three of his mates to stand in the line with him. Then they go and get four pairs, and then next pair they double sell it. And then next minute he's he's paying two hundred and fifty people to stand in the line to then give him the Jordans to then go and sell to like Rick Ross. Where, yeah. and he's young. He's like sixteen years old. He's a millionaire. Yeah. But that all oh, that comes from the deep poverty issue of where like he just needed to buy have some money to to buy some Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's just if you look at the mental. drug side one, if you look at the drug one, the greatest example I can think of is probably Jay Z. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Right, like that guy. Yeah, go on. From from drug dealer to what billionaire right now, which is crazy when you think about it. No formal education, you know, he's running the streets, you know, and then he started making music, created his own label because no one wanted him, and now he he's got his own label. He's got his own sports agency, which is big, by the way. At the same time, like. Uh, how many musicians have got their own agency you know so it's, it's actually crazy when you think about it that's the probably the greatest example of a drug dealer who made it into the mainstream and then now is a billionaire which yeah. is I me mean, that's the craziest yeah absolutely that's yeah. absolute bangers as well yeah. you don't talk don't talk came up about that <laughs> <laughs> i was watching i was watching a chris rock um interview yesterday and he was talking about they asked him for his top five and they were like we shouldn't even include Jay in this. And I was literally, I was like, I need to screen record this and send this to AV. Because he was like, we don't include Jay in this because Jay's like out here. And the, and the guy goes, what about Big Impact? He's like, yeah, they're there. But Jay's like, they're there. And I was like, I need to <laughs> this is Chris Rock talking. Right? quite on the last podcast, right? The, the one thing I give to Jay is that he's done it for, like, he's done it so many times over and over again. And also in different genres as well. Mm. So he's not just done like um, the hip hop, the 90s hip hop style. He's, he's, he's continued to evolve. With the times and he's done it mainstream he's done it commercial he's done it on the street he's done all types of music and then still like sold out all of them yeah and it's the level of consistency as well right if you think about it that's yeah. what high performance really is isn't it it's like well how consistent can you be over a period of time well i, I don't know like i think i think you can be a high performer but inconsistent mm. i think that's about managing energies and managing uh all the, the peril, all the downsides that come with high performance, whether it could be drink, drugs, uh, excess lifestyle, poor lifestyle, um, 
burnout, mental health, uh, all the different things that, because most people who are driving forward this can end up on that spectrum. So you've got to like balance it. And I think if you can balance it and ride it, you can keep going. Like, I think for me, the biggest example in sport for me personally, because I can relate to is Cristiano Ronaldo. I think that guy and, and even Lionel Messi, but I think Ronaldo, I don't want to get into that debate, but Ronaldo as a high performing athlete, I think there's no one better. You just think about who, where he started from. Um, you know, he's a weak, skinny Man United football player who kept getting kicked over to, to that dedication to become the best and then continue to evolve and continue to become the best in, in multiple different places. And I just think uh, that is like the epitome of, of high performance in, in, in sport, in, at least in Europe anyway. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. But it's also the consistency, right? If yeah, you did like, it for one season, you'd be like, okay, he did it for one great season. That was yeah. it. It's like JJ Okocha. But now he's done it for over <laughs> 20, he's done it for 20 years now where like he's the GOAT. Right, yeah, yeah. so the goat title only comes after, in my opinion, yeah, yeah, a longevity. Longevity for me counts for a lot. I mean, look at Roger Federer. That's another example. Like yeah, yeah, right. that guy's been doing it for like over twenty years, and he's still like somehow has the drive to go and play tennis. Like, if you were Roger Federer, you'd probably put most people would have put the hung their boots up ten years ago. But he's still going out there, still wins. Um, all to be honest, in tennis are in a in a fortunate position right now. They got like three people who've been yeah. doing it for a long, long time. Yeah. And that's very rare. Like you've got three people at the top of the game and they just pretty much win everything. It's, yeah. it's very rare for that. For that for, I, don't, I don't remember any other sport having that for a long, that, that sort of period of time. I mean, the only other example is probably go, go, golf. When Tiger, yeah, just, before, just before Tiger, when it was like Nicola, uh, Nicholson. Uh, I mean, look at Tiger. That's a perfect example of like high performance, but pulling off the spectrum a few too many times. <laughs> <laughs> falling on top of too many people oh, that's also like <laughs> deep root issues yeah that's that's what I'm saying yeah yeah. that whole deep root issue conversation that's Tiger Woods there as a, as a nutshell yeah because he's yeah, been playing yeah. golf since he was three years old right so it's like that burnout probably caught up with him in different areas other things <laughs> <laughs> this is a poor lifestyle choice yeah let's do that but he, he has the same lifestyle choices as Jordan if you think about it like we we talk about Jordan being elite, but also Jordan. What was the first episode? What did he say? I never used to drink. Gambling problem, yeah. Yeah, I never used to drink and smoke for the first in my first years. I was just like, yeah, chilled out. End of documentary. Cigar <laughs> after every game, drinks a cognac after every, every episode. Still drinking, and his eyes are bloodshot yellow. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's that's the basically the effects of it after a while. I think there's, there, there is that level of coping mechanism, isn't it? like what yeah, is your coping coping mechanism to, to keep yourself in the in the game? And that's another interesting conversation. Like, what do people do to stay in the game for a long period of time? Mm. Because you have to. Like, I think everyone who's on that who's on that drive, there is always a, a contrast or a complete opposite that is counterproductive to what they're doing, but is almost needed to keep them going. It's the duality, isn't it? It's the yeah. uh, what a drug giver, giver, a drug taker. So you know, you you I've uh, used that one before, Ibiza. Um, <laughs> but when you go, when you when you have such far positive, there's that duality of spectrum that brings you back to that neutral position. And the higher he goes in his height and height and height of his fantastic elusive career, and not to mention all of the money that came with branding and sp- uh, sponsorship, etc., like that, is that there had to be the other side of it to pull him back down. Otherwise, it just has to happen. Yeah. What do you think um, for us lay individuals who can't jump or over six foot or, or don't play basketball, what do you think the key is for our high performance to recovery? Ratio? Well, I think like if you think about what we do, um, we we just do it in a different way. Uh, we just push the boat out on a, on a different spectrum. It's like, you know, we're bashing on a keyboard most of the time, um, but like, so we're not we're not physically ex- exhausting ourselves. That's what I'm trying to get. We're not physically exhausting ourselves, but mentally, we do need that um, wind back, and it's it's finding that what is your mental wind back. And this is something I struggle with. But I, you know, I'm very open with it as well. I struggle with like, how do you find the the pullback in your in the drive, and what is the 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 essential like what is the the I don't know if escape's the right word, but what's the way that you pull pull it back? Um, I don't know if I found it yet. So yeah, I'm always open for ideas. <laughs> always open for okay. Do you think you will? I don't know because I, I'm not really looking to minimize it. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Like I, I, you know, I went through a period last year when I was like, this isn't like I don't think this is a good way to live. But then I realized this is the way I am. 
And I was like, well, you know, I spoke about this on the, on the last podcast of the year about uh, 20 things I learned. And I said, instead of trying to like find a new bucket, I just need to fill the holes in the bucket I have. And I think that's the key is like, how do you, what's the, what do I need to keep doing to keep myself running in this gear? And for me, most of it is related to training and nutrition and, and all of that. And, but at the same time, it's also around like, what is the, the way to clear the fuzz after, after a heavy week or after a heavy period of being up, you know, balls to the walls. Rewatching the wild. Yeah. <laughs> Rewatching the wild. Yeah, that's probably why. Yeah. Problem with those kind of shows, it gets your mind churning. <laughs> yeah, because you're sending me a, um, you'll send me like a quote from there or something like that. I'd be like, check out this. Do you remember this scene? Yeah. <laughs> It's all in the game, yo. The game yeah. is the game. That's what it is. That's that's the thing, isn't it? The game is the game. Yeah. It's just there's like there's 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 benefits and drawbacks to the whole thing, isn't it? Like all the benefits that come with the game, there are also like plenty of drawbacks. And it's just how can you manage the drawbacks, keep pushing forward and keep winning? Yeah. I'm probably gonna go down the rabbit hole of it isn't the things that uh, keep you aligned with that keep pushing effectively your rules on a day-to-day basis and how you you live because yeah. because if you don't have the rules like your rules are effectively like a 10-pin bowl alley that keep you locked in and then when you're rolling down there it could stop you from falling down the gutter um that's a quite a good one yeah. um and 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 that allows you to keep hitting the pins every single day um, and without those rules, you'll be slipping down the gutter in no time uh, and not, not hitting the pins. Um, for people that are in this position where they're probably, let's, let's pretty get back to like investment or like people that are starting to hit that high performance mentality from consolidation investment. What do you think the important rules are for people? I know everyone's a different, but what have you found? Okay, man. I think it's finding your own rules first. Um, because like you said, everyone's different, right? But then, you know, let's say someone puts out their own rules on the Facebook group, like, oh my God, this works for me. Isn't going to work for most people, right? Because it's so individual to them. So one thing is, one thing you want to do is establish your own rules to begin with. It's like, okay, what do I need to follow to ensure that I perform to the best of my ability, whether it's like being the best parent to my kids, being the best person at my job, because if that, if you're the best person in your job, you end up, you know, being that security blanket for your family, essentially. Um, so finding out what your rules are and what you want to make your rules as well. I think that's uh, probably the number one thing, in my opinion. I think, yeah, we've been talking a lot about refining rules and, and using them to drive performance. And I'm seeing more and more. Like this week, you know, I, I'm, I meant to check in with you and I haven't checked in with you. And I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Uh, but and then the interesting is, like, I I felt like I did check in with you some like very briefly on a, on a one on Wednesday. Ah. I, I don't know why I'm using that as a check. <laughs> <laughs> but but what I was thinking about is I was um, you know, this week I was thinking uh, I'm getting like f- uh, four p.m. and I'm just not being able to get that final push to six like I used to. And then I was looking through my training logs and I realized that in the last five weeks, you know, I had a lot on the last five weeks. In the last five weeks, I haven't completed a full training week. I didn't even realize that until I sat back and looked at it. And each week I was missing one or two sessions here or there, which is very unlike me, but it was a big lapse in my rules. Cause early in this week, I was, we were doing this exercise. We we're like identifying like key vulnerabilities and key difficulties that I have. Um, and, and you were going in on as well. And one of the key um, red line drivers for me is my training quality. I know if my training quality is going down, my motivation and training is going down, then something isn't right. Like something's off. And, um, uh, that's when I, it clicked and I was like, oh, I need to make sure this week I hit all, se- all sessions. And I've done it. I've hit all sessions. But, I was like, I, I, but the funny thing is I didn't realize it until I looked on those rules and I realized what my uh, key drivers are and, and just got to ensure that those are always being met. Yeah, yeah, so important. And for people that are coming from, let's say, let's give an example of someone that's coming from losing lots of weight, those habits that they formed beforehand it's very much easy to slip back into those old patterns. And for you, that old pattern was not being able to do your four to six, which didn't have a massive carryover into your body weight at all or anything like that. But for someone else, that that might mean... Game, right? Yeah, four kilo gain. Um, or or might mean the, the KFC bucket starts coming back in on a Friday night. 
or now that McDonald's is back open or whatever, um, is that those rules and the identification of that importance of that rule will allow you to keep those gutters open or off on the air. One thing I also realized this week is um, because I've been paying a bit more attention to my training this week, and I realized that um, one thing I'm missing from the gym more than anything is the ability to just take one set and go balls out. I don't even know why I I see like I don't have to do it here because I obviously can do it here, but in lockdown for some reason I've been dialing my I've been doing like more reps but more sets as well like more volume, and I just haven't been getting that same sort of drive. So what I did today and what I've done this week in a lot of my exercise, just done like one set and I've just, and I've cranked up the music really loud. Uh, like, you know, really like two, and I did my usual like old rituals I used to do in the gym. And I thought, you know what? I've got this banded RDL. I don't know how much weight this is because I just put all the weights I can fit on the thing. And then I put three bands over my neck. So I don't know what the tension is at the top. But I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take this set to absolute failure and just go to like as, as many as I get. I don't really care how many. I end up getting like 14 or 15 reps. And I just felt, I did it. And I just felt so good. I felt like that, that's what I'd be missing. Um, so I'd fallen into the volume rabbit hole when really I know I thrive off that intensity. And that was just another insight into rules that I should probably play around with. Is also like, the, the precursors as well, right? Like your precursor was there, music, you yeah. know, and understanding the rituals once again. That's also quite huge for a lot of people, it's, especially you know what I've done in the last few weeks. I started listening to different music. Like I used to, when I go to the gym, there's always like a few playlists I play. And there's always like either heavy hardcore hip hop or heavy rock music. What I started doing recently was just like playing, picking an artist and just playing, you know, Apple iTunes, you got Essential. Ah, soft. Just playing like whatever. <laughs> so like, Man, I just look to Top 40, brother. Oh, Top 40. <laughs> <laughs> like, Ellie, Ellie Golden. Yeah, like, whatever Essentials come up and I'm just playing it and I realised, I was like, I went for like three, four weeks with it and I was like, what am I doing? Like, that's probably half the reason. I'm listening to this shit and I'm not even getting into it. <laughs> like, He's click, clicking along on it at set. It's hard enough. To, it's hard enough to train um, at home as it is. Get motivated, and I'm listening there, listening to Apple Apple Music Essentials, uh, wondering why I'm not getting. No, one day I'm not going to drive to train. So today I, like, I had to blast on. I I think I played. Um, today I put a two pack on. And I just put the music up like louder than normal. And also because I'm at home, I've been playing the music quietly. So I've just been like, you know, your quiet music. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've just kind of re, re, reset myself there. But I realized there's a few things there that just tie up in my rules that allow me to perform my best. Okay. So, yeah. Stop, stops you going down the gutter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was, that was it. I came out of it and I was like, oh, man, I've, I've missed that feeling. Because you know when you do volume, you can kind of coast the whole session, right? You can coast it. You can, uh, you, you don't really have to focus and you can just kind of get on with it. Whereas today, I was like, I've got this one set. And when it gets tough, like you gotta, you gotta be, you can't be focusing anywhere else. And it's yeah. that whole negative effect that you get. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh. what about your rules? Yeah, go on. So my rules, obviously, we 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 speak about them quite often as well with our check-ins. Um, but from a training perspective, it's always having that music. I need to have some music. I can't train like with nothing on or anything like that. I need I need something. So usually it's, it's Meek Mill. Like it's never changed. If you look at my rules as well, it's never changed from like same it's championship always, album. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite albums where it gets me hyped. But also reminds me of a time when, because we were going to games as well, right? With that music on, that was like our precursor when we entered the city. Like imagine into Philadelphia, that's where Meek's from, and you play his Dreams and Nightmares song. Yo, you're you're getting hyped anyway, so it puts me in that kind of zone, and I'm like, this is this is perfect, and I'm ready to kind of roll. So for me, it's always like, what's my precursor towards like training pre workout? Komodo pump um and it's, it's the music it's getting the championship album ready the intro as soon as the intro starts you're right all right this is it this time to get time to get ready and, and start the the session basically yeah i was gonna say they've got a few listening questions uh oh, that cool. in. um i just thought we'd, we'd go through a few of them and both of them so we, we you know we mentioned we we're gonna talk about the in the investment phase um and then I think two people pretty much asked around um, aggressive muscle building investment phases about embracing the fluff and how fluffy should you be willing to get? Mm. How does that muscle building strategy change with age uh, and maximizing recovery uh, from muscle growth? Um, like how much weight should you put on per year? So there's a lot of things around that. Um, so maybe we could touch a little bit about embracing the fluff, um, and, but more so than that, like how it relates to high performance, just to keep the, with the theme of this podcast is you know, a lot of people think like that goes against it, but we'll talk about how you can you can embrace the fluff, have an aggressive muscle building phase, 
but still keep that high performance mindset. Mm. An interesting question, actually. Into, are you, are you, and you're referring to the, are you referring to the embracing the fluff actually of body fat, or are you talking embracing the fluff of high performance in terms of like uh, a difficult difficult challenge to what you're used to? Uh, let's start with the let's tackle both. Because it isn't effectively just embracing the fluff, something new, uh, getting used to an adjustment period, and then uh, finding your new norm. Because definitely for me, let's let's relate it back to body fat. Like I said to you, I'm feeling fat at 69. But like this week, 69, same body weight, still I feel great. But I had a period of four weeks where I felt about I was embracing the fluff because I thought I was fat. Um, and it, the embracing the fluff is a period of like discomfort and challenge to something that you're used to. It's not about how big you should get or uh, how if 10 kilos is too much yeah of course if you've got if you've got massive massive blow handles and you, you you're massive then it's not going to be something that have a massive a great optimal muscle building phase uh, yeah and you're just going to feel lethargic and stuff yeah um but the ability to embrace the fluff at different periods like two kilos three kilos above where you had your photo shoot or consolidated you're going to start feeling those t-shirts a little bit more and they're going to catch a new love handle you're going to be oh damn i forgot no that's not right i i doubted all that off and you're like oh well here comes the new new adjustment period and then two more kilos comes and you're like you're wearing top like this where this is like you know tight as tight as anything and you're like (laughs) okay maybe i need to buy a medium top and then and then it'll be fine for a while and then it'll it'll kind of subside and the feelings will kind of neutralize and normalize and then two more two more kilos later i'm sure i'm gonna have the same problem um but it's that it's that challenge and just riding that dip because it is a dip and and it's not about uh, embracing high high fat levels um yeah. it's, it's about actually keeping to the rules sticking to your guns of what the goal is of the long term and then uh, maximizing that on a day-to-day basis. Of course, there's going to be some discomfort, but you might as well force discomfort on yourself as opposed to be imposed on you by something else. Well, I think everyone should go through. I had, a, I had a chat with someone the other day, and I was they were asking like, you know, I want to get I want to get a bit bigger. I want to uh, feel. I want to be a bit leaner. You know, the usual sort of things. Like they want everything. And I was like, well, the problem is you're chasing two rabbits. And for most people, if you've just hit your checkpoint in anything, you need to go through a period of embracing the fluff at least once. Because if you want to make major improvements in something, you have to embrace all the fluff that comes with improvement uh, and the excess that comes with improvement in order to see the rewards in the other side. And I think, and, and the question was around age as well. And, you know, we're talking about embracing the fluff in, in body transformation, but you can apply this to everything, right? Um, but if you just talk about age, I think the level you, which you embrace the fluff when you're in your 45, 50, 40s and, you know, 40, 45, 50 is going to be less than when you're for 20, 25, 30, 35. Um, absolutely, because I think health also comes into it, and you you probably want to minimize any um, risk of uh, poorer body composition on health. So I think I don't think there's a need to go crazy with embracing the graph. But at the same time, I think you can still push push it out there without it getting silly, like Nathan was saying. Like he was saying, you don't need to get fat in the process, but you can definitely uh, lose a bit of sharpness in order to uh, take it to the next level. Because once you do it once, I think the next time, then you can take a much more leaner, slower approach. Yeah, hundred percent. If like embracing a fluff for somebody, maybe gaining two kilos and then getting over that because they've never had it, the the. I assume for you as well, the the more you embrace the fluff was like the later on in a, in a building phase. Like you, your first one wasn't when you 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 just got super super big. It's like you you had a period of building up of what you thought was embracing the fluff. Yeah. And then you got over that feedback loop. Um, I mean, every every time you do it, about I've definitely realized that, you know, in every investment phase I've done, I've always ended up being embracing the fluff. I can't do the long-term lifestyle solution. I just find it boring. Honestly, I just think, like, if you want to make real results, doing the long-term slow lifestyle solution is good for people who don't want to make improvements. If you just want to maintain, then definitely go for lifestyle solution because you're... Um, you'll be better at maintaining you'll learn how to better maintain which is goal in itself it isn't the same as just maintaining because if you just maintain and think i'm just going to maintain you'll slowly stagnate and, yeah. and slowly revert but what i'm talking about is like lifestyle solution in that you, you learn how to have your cake and eat it while staying lean but if you want to make improvements then i, I just think like, until you're really happy and satisfied with what you've got physique wise or whatever it may be you have to embrace the fluff with what comes with it um, <laughs> Do you think the moment that you can really embrace the fluff is when you actually realize that the visual 
uh, being isn't as important as the rest of your the reason why you train. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Like I think I've I I went from the guy who was uh, in the vest. Like I, I've had the phase where I'm in my vest. You know, it's, it's crazy as it might sound because you always see me training in a hoodie now. Uh, I've had that phase of of training in my vest and you know. Uh, yeah, I remember that. my top off at any opportunity to now where I'm in a hoodie most of the time so is Nate there by the way yeah, yeah. oh he looks frozen on my screen I think he's uh, frozen he's frozen isn't he yeah yeah I mean, he's just gonna come back in a minute yeah well, that's a bit worrying considering he's recording this <laughs> <laughs> um, oh no, let me message him in a minute carry on yeah, so I've had that. Well, well, the thing is, if he's frozen, he's not going to hear any of the, any of this, and he's recording it. So we just have to ask Big James to cut this out. Yeah. Hold on. He's is online. It? He's online, so we'll see. Let's type in. It's crashed. Oh, are you kidding me? Wait, does that mean the whole podcast is done? Well, I don't know. We'll find out soon. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, we've got it on. Um, we've got it streaming on Facebook, so we can always download it off that. Yeah, true, true, true. But let's see. Let's just wait for him. Give it a couple minutes. Uh... What's he say? He's like, it's just crashed. And then he's, I told him to try again, see what he says now. Yeah, on the, on the Facebook group, he's crashed as well. He says, how did I just mic drop? Because <laughs> he did the whole laugh, right? And then he literally just sat back and I'm like, damn. Um, but Pooja did say we can, she can hear us. Yeah. Oh, maybe we'll carry on there. Right, let's do it. <laughs> just strip the order. We'll cut this little bit out. Um, so you just tell James where, where this is. I just put, I just put a clap in, just so he remembers. Yeah, go on. All right, James, just cut out the last like minute or so. Uh, this is, by the way, like a, a behind the scenes of what a true podcast looks like. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, this is the stuff that we have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Jamie's Jamie's podcast uh, that crashed like within five minutes ago. My, my whole computer crashed five minutes ago. Couldn't believe it. Damn. So what do you guys do? So then I had to restart. I had to shut the computer down. Um, so now I'm the host now. Just send him the let me send him the link. Can you send him the link? Yeah, I will. Uh, so I had to, sh- had to shut the whole thing down, um, restart the computer, and then my internet didn't work for 10 minutes. And luckily, she, she, she wasn't doing anything, so she was free, so she, she stayed online. And uh, we had to go back on and record the last five minutes. <laughs> so frustrating. I was like. Yeah. Now I've messaged him again, so we'll see. It's probably going to come back in a minute. Um, apologies, guys, for, for those of you who are watching live on Facebook. Cheeky little mic drop. First time we get another guest in, <laughs> in the building. <laughs> and then we end up crashing the whole system out. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't want to. I want to wait for him to come back on, just in case uh, he can still record it. Hopefully, he's got the recording. Oh yeah, yeah. But it's also on Facebook Live, right? So you said yeah, we can. Probably would be better on uh, on here. Uh, what's he saying? Is he is he coming in? He's he's seen it. I think he's trying to come back in. A message him. Let's see. Otherwise, I may have to ring him instead. <laughs> what was that? I may have to ring him instead. In the middle of it, I'll be like, "Hey, where are you at?" Yeah, go on. Just listen. He's picking up heat as well. Where is he?
All right. Um, well, what were we talking about? Just so we can um, carry on that, and then I'll just change to cut this out. Um, embracing the fluff. Raises and embracing the fluff. Yeah. Uh, what was I left? What was I left with? What was the last thing I said? Um, embracing it and what it really means. Uh, oh, getting better. Oh, yeah. So what I said is like the visual doesn't make a difference. Oh, he's back. He's back. Is it that? Yeah, he's back. Oh. Way. What a time for the internet to go. <laughs> hey, did it record on the phone on your computer? That's some bad news for you. No, it's just the thing where it's converting, no? Yeah, 29 seconds of it for apparently. No, that's the first that's the first recording. But we had two recordings. Remember you did two recordings? Oh, we'll have a look. We're still on Facebook, by the way. Remember there was a there was a there, remember we did a test recording at the beginning and then we did a second recording. Okay, that hasn't come up yet. All right, anyway, so let's let's go back to what we were saying. So you said um, about uh, visual. Uh, so I'll just okay. Uh, let's just clap again for James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, really on my phone. James, the last time yeah, if he's host now. No, I record. Oh, okay. I record this bit now. Oh wait, you know what? Let's just give him the Facebook recording. Yeah, yeah. Let's ask Joan to Facebook record it. Uh, strip the Facebook audio. Yeah, just make it easier. Yeah, and then and then yeah. So James, just cut out all this bit that we've been talking about in the last like five six minutes, yeah. and just go back to. Um... Man, you just ruined the whole flow, didn't you? <laughs> James, just sort it out when you do it. Time, let's go. <laughs> all, right. all right. Yeah. So what I would say is. Um... When I first started training, uh, when I first in the early days, I was definitely that guy who was, um, you know, in, in my vest uh, in the in the in the gym and and any excuse to take my top off, and it was very much visually driven. Um, but in the last like probably six, seven, eight years, it's just been, you know, hoodies and joggers and you know, I don't I don't really, um, it's it's not really about the physical for me. It's you know, the physical is the is the extra but it's all the other things like it gives me like i was just talking to you about the the training and then and not doing my intensity versus volume and uh you know listening to the wrong music and, and all that sort of stuff it's because of what that gives me the meditative effects of it all so i think um it does depend on where you are in that journey if you're very much new to it and you just you just got into a shape that you've never really considered before you are going to want to be you're going to be more reluctant uh, of embracing the fluff whereas if you've now made it a new norm you'll you'll allow yourself to dive into that uh deeper aggressive muscle building phase or investment phase uh for, and get what it's uh, get uh all, all the benefits that it can bring yeah, so i definitely yeah. think it's a learned trait and uh each one of my investment phases i'd say i, I i'm i'm not probably not going to repeat the one i did like in 2018 you know <laughs> came out loves that one right you know when i hit 90 91 kilos i probably won't go that that big again mainly because like double chin know, right? my face just gets too bloated and you know i can't everything just looks weird like i, I you know it just it just looks bad um i say where i'm at now is probably like the upper limit like 84 uh 84 ish 83 84 maybe 85 maybe 85 but probably not more than that because after that it just there's the diminishing returns in performance as well like for me performance caps out around 86 87 and after that it's just, it's just pure extra body weight with no performance gains so my best my best all-time lifts in the gym have always been around 86 87 maybe 87 and a half when i've trained at 90 i've never been any stronger which is interesting so yeah i definitely think it's a learned trait to to learn to embrace that fluff and and learn how to throw yourself in all in on the other side that's not dieting but a muscle building yeah you can't you can't um you really can't embrace every all the benefits and all like all the journey without letting go of that you don't have to let go of the whole visual thing it's like sure it matters uh to some some degree but at some point during your journey and during my journey definitely me now i realize that 63 65 yeah doesn't matter it, it really doesn't matter. Like, if I, would I take my top off at the beach now? Yeah, because I'm at a beach rather than whether I was worried about what I look like. 
Yeah, what, um, made, what made it for me is when I like I, I started going on holidays and I didn't care about dieting beforehand. And I think when you make that mindset, that that's when things change for you. When you're still in that, when you're still stuck in like I've got to diet for the beach, I get that. I get the point of doing it. But when you can just rock up and take your top off at the beach, and you know you're not you're not lean lean, but you you, you know you're not out of shape. You just you just you probably just looking normal to be honest. Um, and you're just looking a bit bulkier then I think that's when you know you're really truly comfortable and that's a hard place to get to, but it will come as the more you understand why you're doing this and what it really gives you more than just the stakes. That's when the physical is the vehicle, right? Ooh. Yeah. Love it finished there, okay, mate. Dropped <laughs> <laughs> it. Mic drop. Yeah. yeah. I think we're going to talk about what it takes to be a killer coach, but I think if you want to be a killer coach, you just need to listen to what we've just been talking about the last hour and a half. Yeah. High performance, it's killer mentality, and it's uh, being able to take feedback, being able to take criticism, and uh, taking no prisoners when you're don't, with your, you. Don't, know, be don't, <laughs> don't be a rat. Don't be a puppy. <laughs> don't be a terrorist. You know, <laughs> Just be a high-performing athlete that wants to get results, uh, work with the team, and you'll be a killer. And we've been talking about killer, by the way, because we've been talking about all sorts of people on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what, we, what we mean is like a results-producing uh, results producing coach is what we're talking about. In any field. In any field. Yeah, in any field. I think it all applies. It, all, all the things we talk about today. I think the mindset, like, this high performance mindset high performance is a mindset it's not a status or or an economy or um an income bracket or anything like that it's a it's a way of being and it's a way of thinking it's a it's a way of uh mindset and if you can embrace that and bring other people together who also share that mentality you can do some really cool things so when you start winning so when you start winning in those rings son all right guys great chat any parting words? No, it's been great to have you on our podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you should definitely come back on soon. Yeah, we'll get you on next time as well. well thanks for having me. Who, who, would we, who should we get next? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you had Ivan last week, right? Yeah. Should have, uh, next week, you should bring on... I think you should bring on Pimbley next week. Ed Pimbley. Yeah, bring Pimbley on next week. Yeah. Post the checkpoint during the grind well he's in the grind right now here's a funny story that he'll, he'll laugh at he, he, he sent me pictures um he's about 169 i think and he goes to me uh, i said to him last week how tall are you because i've obviously not met him how tall are you he's like uh five nine i said all right let me pull up let me open up the book <laughs> <laughs> how heavy will you mean i'll be there in a second uh yeah you got 20 pounds to go god damn <laughs> um yeah the, the the chart never lies right Never, never seen it. Never, 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 never seen it be beaten. Never. Yeah, if if you are, you're you're probably an an outlier or a genetic freak. Yeah, that's no one that comes to R and T. Awesome guys. All right, guys. Have a good one. You'd have to turn it off. <laughs>